Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to this um, very exciting event, um, uh, uh, which we're organising here at the IFS. Um, I'm not going to spend too long uh, introducing it because we've got a lot to cover. As you can tell from the title, we're only covering climate change, inequalities and ageing uh, in an hour. Um, but we have the best possible people to do that. And of course, the origin of this is uh, from a commission um, uh, reporting to President Macron in France. The commission was run by Jean Tirole and Olivier Blanchard, um, and they will speak um, in, uh, in that order. Uh, Jean, of course, is uh, at the Toulouse School of Economics and a Nobel Prize winner, very famous for a lot of his work um, uh, in various aspects of economics. And he will talk, he will introduce uh, the work of the commission and talk particularly about climate change. Olivier, of course, former chief economist at the IMF and now at, the, at MIT, uh, will then talk more about the inequalities and ageing aspects uh, of the report. I understand from them that this is the first time they have presented outside of France, although there has been huge interest within France. Uh, we'll then get some brief uh, responses from Nick Stern, Richard Blundell and Carol Proper uh, in that order. Nick will respond on climate change, Richard on inequalities, and Carol on ageing and demographics. Uh, they were all members uh, of the Commission, uh, and partly in that sense responsible for the report as well. Uh, please put your questions in the Slido um, app, which you should have access to. Um, put them in as we go through, um, and also, uh, also at the end, and we should have at least 20 minutes uh, for questions to the panel at the end. I will stop at, at that point and invite Jean uh, to kick us off. Well, thanks so much, Paul, and uh, thank you for to the IFS for inviting us and welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm going to start with some introductory remarks um, about the commission and a couple of questions. Why such a commission in the first place? Uh, with COVID, uh, we keep our noses on the ground. And it's essential, we think, to think about the long and medium term. Um, the topics are kind of obvious. There are three existential challenges with very slow evolution, which means that uh, if you don't do anything for a year or two, it doesn't really matter, but one year plus one year plus one year is several decades of inaction, and, and those are huge threats for our societies. Second kind of question is why um, we have um, an international commission. Um, the answer also, also there is obvious. We want to escape the Franco-French debate uh, to take advantage of innovative policies uh, abroad and take, uh, take, uh, use the evidence from abroad. Um, one third of the commission was French, two third was from abroad, uh, including uh, Carol, Nick and, and Richard, thanks so much by the way, for helping us. It was extremely useful. I should say also that of course France is not the UK, there are some differences, so for example, there are very different in, different in terms of inequality, in terms of uh, senior participation in the workplace. Um, but there is a lot in common, and in general, it's very important um, to perform this kind of uh, stock taking. And finally, we can ask why economists, because we are 25 economists plus one sociologist. And um, we wanted to do that. That was a difficult choice. We wanted to do that to get to the bottom of things on the economics front. And of course, it's not going to be the only possible report, and it's just a contribution to the broader reflection process. There are three things we try to do. Uh, first, to take stock of what we know and what we don't know. Um, in each case, for the three challenges, we uh, design a coherent set of measures. So the idea is not just a single reform, but a set of complementary reforms, a kind of holistic view. And finally, we try to measure uh, understand and take into account the perceptions uh, of losers and winners of policies. They can be correct or wrong, 
that it seems to us there is a political economy side of those reforms, which is very important. Let me say a few things about uh, global warming. So no need to convince you it's, uh, it's really existential. Uh, there is a huge emergency and it, it is perceived so by the French, by the way. I mean, it's overwhelmingly recognized as a threat. Uh, even so, most, I mean, most people think that no one should be paying for it, except a few people. Um, but there's still a problem with perception. So, for example, when a policy is visible, like a carbon tax, uh, it's very unpopular. And less popular, uh, le less visible ones, I'm sorry, like bans or subsidies to certain energies, um, which are potentially much more costly um, and also quite regressive in terms of incidence, um, are much less uh, unpopular or sometimes even very popular. So there is a question of um, information democracy there, which is important. At the same time, people perceive correctly that maybe the, the losers of the reforms, like a carbon tax, and, and they have reactions quite legitimate reactions to that. So what do we propose? Um, a triptych of measures of policies to be taken. Uh, first, and despite what I said about the popularity of the carbon tax, a carbon price more generally that includes uh, permits uh, is absolutely necessary. And it's kind of unanimous among economists, but not outside economics. And it's worth repeating why it's important. We want to give the right incentives and not spend more than necessary. We have to go after the cheap sources of avoiding emissions. The second reason is to encourage R&D because if you have a carbon price, especially in the future, uh, it's going to allow inventors of green energy uh, techniques, technology to go up to monetize their innovations. And the third reason, which is less well known, is just to simplify, simplify the work of the state and the work of, of, of economic agents. So the state can contain itself with measuring emission, doesn't need to know more than what has been emitted by each player. And for the economic actors, remember there are billions of decisions to be taken by consumers by by firms and by administrations and it's very complex i mean it goes from big things like eliminating coal but also small things like you know do you want to consume tomatoes which are imported from spain uh, with big transportation costs and emissions or do you want them to uh to buy tomatoes, you want to buy tomatoes grown on the warehouses, um, greenhouses, I'm sorry, greenhouses in England. You know, it's very hard to know. I mean, you know, only a carbon price is going to tell you which one uh, is cheapest, including the emissions which are, uh, which come from, from the production process. Now, to give a little bit more detail, we propose to use the existing allowance system at the European level, so extension of the ETS system to transportation and housing. Um, we say we need some predictability, even so there's a lot of uncertainty and therefore we need flexibility. We offer three ways of offering more predictability as to the future price of carbon. For example, the floor and ceiling, but there are other ways. Um, we are in favor of a carbon tax adjustment at the European border, of course. Um, we recognize there are big drawbacks to it. The implementation is not easy, but we still think it's essential uh, as a way of uh, preventing imports and or offshoring uh, to green, uh, to, to non-green countries. And finally, even so we economies don't like earmarking in general, um, we offer to compensate losers of a carbon price through explicit redistribution and earmarking of uh, tax revenue. Um, it's not obvious either to do, but it's important. Second leg, we want to have R&D subsidies um, because we need subs 
substantial technological progress we want to achieve the COP21 objectives. Uh, for example, storage technologies for, for wind and, and, and solar energies and so on. Um, for multi multiple reasons. Uh, the first reason is that it's likely that the carbon price would be too low for political reasons. The standard spillover uh, argument in favor of encouraging uh, R&D. And also in the case of carbon, uh, we want to develop technologies that we can give to poor countries. Um, we propose an ARPA-E uh, body in order to uh, select projects for disruptive innovation. The key there is not the money, it's uh, appropriate governance a uh, clean process to select projects. We sell to do it in, in, the, in the report. Third leg, standards, bans, and targeted subsidies. Uh, we need them uh, because the price won't suffice in general because it's too, it will be too low or, or consumers will be imperfectly informed. But at the same time, we have to keep some this under check uh, by trying to estimate implicit costs in terms of ton of CO2 avoided. So we discuss at length this, this issue, um, how to both use those instruments, which are very useful, but at the same time, not to spend too much uh, because the cost of a ton of carbon might be five euros as it might be uh, 1,000 euros. Finally, we uh, dismiss some false uh, good ideas, uh, things which are very generous on paper and are very good. Uh, but actually backfire. So in France, we have a new law, for example, on, on the inclusion of environmental criteria in public procurement. So it's not only allowed, but it will be mandatory actually to include environmental criteria in public procurement, which sounds right. I mean, it sounds just right, except that it's wrong. It's wrong because uh, there will be no consistency in, in the carbon price uh, so some local governments, some city halls will be using five euros and another one will be using 2000 euros per ton of carbon avoided. And second issue is of course that local authorities are not equipped to measure the carbon emissions, you know, especially along the supply chain. It's almost impossible uh, for local authority to do that. Um, and also, we, we are not quite in favor of a green central bank. Of course, uh, all the stress test business based on, uh, on, the, uh, on the environmental uh, shock, of course, is important. But going beyond this raises issues of legitimacy. I mean, uh, it becomes really a political body and a lot of issues we detail in the report. And the general feeling is that we need a strong state, not one which is going to strike to shrug off its responsibility and try to pass them on to other less well-equipped economic actors. We really need the government to be very strong in its policy against uh, global warming. So that, that concludes the, um, uh, the climate part and the introduction. And now uh, I'll let Olivier uh, take over. Good. Uh, well, first, let me uh, again uh, thank the IFS for organizing this. We think that uh, what uh, we have thought about for France is relevant in many dimensions uh, for other countries. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the other two chapters. Uh, the first one is inequality. Sorry about that. Uh, the, the, the facts are interesting. I mean, France is different, for example, from the UK. Uh, inequality is much less according to you know, Gini coefficients on income or wealth. And it hasn't gotten much worse over time. It actually has remained more or less the same. Despite that, and when you do, uh, when, when you do polls, you find that people are extremely sensitive to the issue and think it's a really big issue to, to deal with. And they point to things which are not easy to capture with Gini coefficients. Uh, inequalities of opportunity, in effect, you know, probability, uh, access to good jobs, uh, careers, uh, satisfi satisfying careers, and so on, Mo uh, social mobility from one generation to the next. And in, that di in those dimensions, France is not doing great, and therefore, this is what, what we focused on. In terms of 
of the strategy uh, that we think uh, should be used. Again, uh, Jean has used the word triptych for, uh, for, for global warming. And again, here, it's easy to think of a triptych uh, of, of, of measures or set of measures, which basically is, you, you can fight inequalities at free margins. You can fight them before production, kind of trying to equalize the chances that people have to get good jobs and satisfying careers. Uh, you can work at the other end, uh, which is after production, uh, basically compensating people who have done poorly for various reasons, uh, which is typically the way people think about this. And then you can think about doing it during production, which is can you organize production, the organization of firms, so that basically you know, there are more good jobs, better access to good jobs. The part which is most new, I think, in, in, in what we say is really in the middle. Uh, which is maybe we should think harder about what we can do at that margin. So let me just go through each of the three. So before production, I mean, how do you decrease inequality of, of chances? And there are clearly two margins. The first one is education. And I suspect that the UK numbers are probably similar to France. Uh, France is not doing great on average. That's not what matters here, uh, but there is enormous inequality. Uh, across, across kids. Uh, and therefore, a lot more has to be done. Now, the French government actually has embarked on a fairly ambitious program called uh, initially RAP and now RAP, and, and which is basically making for smaller classrooms uh, for kids in, 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 in parts of the country where there is a need for more. Uh, the first set of results is actually quite good. And our conclusion is that much more can be done. It's going to cost money, uh, but it's absolutely central. So I think that except for the level of spending is not, is not controversial. The part which is more controversial, sorry, I've lost you. I'm coming back, uh, is uh, inequality of wealth. And uh, what's absolutely striking is that, you know, some kids start life with a lot. Uh, they get it either at the beginning of who are the early part of their life, and some kids start with absolutely nothing. And we know that a good part of the inequality comes from the transmission of, of this wealth. So we argue uh, for actually uh, a, a tax on, uh, on inheritance, but we're thinking it quite a bit. It exists in France, it's extremely inefficient. And we don't think that's the way to go. We, we, we think of it as a tax which we, would we distribute from the very rich kids uh, to the poor kids. And, and when you think about it, what you want to do is have a tax on uh, what the people receive, the beneficiaries rather than the people who give. And you want to do it over their lifetime. If they get a lot, and you know, if you wait for your parents to die, you clearly get the money very late in life, too late to make much of a difference. So it really has to be on the donations throughout life. Uh, it has to be at the level such that most people don't have to pay taxes. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the polls show that the French are totally opposed uh, to any kind of inheritance tax. Uh, they think that what they have accumulated by hard work is theirs, can be given to their kids. And I think that's very relevant and therefore the threshold has to be very high. And then the last thing is that again, as for the carbon tax, you probably want to send a signal that this is not the state taking your money. It is a transfer to a very specific group of people who need it more than you do. And therefore it seems okay to allocate all or some of the uh, revenues two programs helping the uh, kids will need it. So it could be, you know, help to additional education, could take various forms, but we think that's important for the selling. Uh, again, this is a major source of continuing inequality, generational inequality, and, and uh, generation to generation inequality, and, and, and something has to be done. On after production, I'll come back to doing production at the end. After production, and what has happened over time in France, as well as in, any, in most other countries, is that capital has become, uh, has become uh, more mobile. And therefore, as a result, the tax on capital has come down. And what we argue is that progress can be made in limiting the mobility of capital, and therefore increasing the tax on capital. 
two dimensions among uh, more. The first one is what has just been signed in the last few weeks, which is an agreement to tax multinational companies in, in, in a more, uh, in a higher, uh, with a higher tax. And we think it's essential, you know, more than 15% would be good, but we understand the politics. Uh, the other is uh, AI. Uh, basically, you can use AI to see who is likely to have reported the income uh, honestly or not, uh, that makes a difference. Uh, you know, in the US, we know we're just giving more money to the IRS would help. But then even in the countries which do a good job, AI can do more. So we argue for a higher taxation of capital. We don't go into the whole fiscal system, which would be too ambitious, but we make that recommendation. Now, let me get to the during production, which is how can we increase the number of good jobs, access facilitate access to good jobs and so on. And so, well, the first question is, what is a good job? I don't think a good job is, you know, is the kind of jobs we have. These are good jobs, but these are jobs where you're decently paid, you have some responsibility, you have some sense of what the career could be, and uh, the environment is, is, is nice. Uh, how can you achieve all this? So, what has happened until now is, is I think that policies have very much taken the distribution of jobs as a given. Uh, there are some good jobs, there are some bad jobs. And the best we can do, and it's absolutely essential, is do professional training so that people can get those jobs. And professional training is indeed extremely important. And there is a major reform in France, and we think it's going in the right direction. Uh, to basically train people, not only at the beginning, but throughout life, and train them for the jobs which exist, which is typically, uh, which is often not the case. But what we push, and this is very much the influence of Danny Roderick, and I think he has convinced us that uh, it's worth exploring, Danny Roderick was a member of the commission, uh, is that maybe we can do more. We can actually uh, increase the number of good jobs. We can increase the number of decent careers in firms. Uh, we can do it through traditional means. I mean, clearly, for example, if the price of capital uh, increases relative to the price of labor, so if you tax capital more, this is going to lead firms to look at technologies which use more labor less capital, that's well goes one way. You can think of labor legislation, uh, which basically gives incentives to keep people, inform people and train people. Uh, something like a bonus malus system applied to various dimensions. So you can do that. Uh, you should do that. Uh, but the question is whether you can do more. And we explore, this is really exploration, uh, how, for example, the employment office can work better with firms and with training agencies to basically do a better job of creating more good jobs. And we discussed whether, you know, you'd like robots or software to be complements to people, to workers, rather than substitutes. And the question is, can you basically put in place some subsidies or some subsidy system, which basically subsidizes the research, which makes them more likely to be complements? It's far from obvious, there are direct effects, there are indirect effects, but we think it has to, that box has to be open because in the end, that's where the inequalities come from in large part from the technological side. And so doing something would, would be good. So this is it for inequalities. Let me now turn to, to the last uh, topic, which is uh, demography. <clears throat> Now here again, it's going to be idiosyncratic. Well, not all countries have the same demographic dynamics. Uh, in France, uh, the demographics are mostly reflecting an increase in uh, life expectancy and in the quality of, of life uh, at, uh, uh, with increased expectancy. So this is really good news as opposed to the first two parts which start from bad news and try to repair. Here it's good news. Fertility in France is just a bit low, but it's not a major issue. So the issue of demographics is really we have an aging society and that's what we have uh, focused on. Uh, uh, when there is aging, there are all kinds of things which change. Some people think that economies lose dynamism. We're not sure that this is the case. There's a very practical issue, which is the distribution of time between work and retirement, and presumably an increase in the age of retirement over time, 
uh, in line with the increase in, in life expectancy. So this is a big deal. This is what we have to, this is what we focused on. Uh, and then there's a French idiosyncrasy, which I understand is not uh, applicable to the UK, which is that people stop work very early in France. I mean, at 60, many people don't work anymore. And so you have to think about the whole issue, which is, yes, you have to reform the retirement system or adapt it, uh, but you have to make sure that people are willing to work longer and that firms are willing to hire uh, workers longer. So again, there's a triptych. The main part of a triptych is the reform of a retirement system, not only because it's important, but because in France, it's, uh, you know, there was a program, there was a reform uh, in, in front of parliament, which was suspended before of COVID. So it's coming back. And so we had to address it. Uh, but the other two dimensions uh, are terribly important. What can we do to make workers more willing to work longer? Uh, and what can we do to make firms more willing to hire workers longer? So let me just talk a bit, if I'm, yes, I think we're still on time, uh, about what we uh, see a good retirement system. Now, again, the specifics are going to be more French, but the, uh, the first issue, I'm not going to talk about the existing one, which is a complete mess with uh, 40 different programs, uh, totally opaque in terms of what you get, what the rules are, how it's financed, and so on and so on. So I'm going to talk about what we think a good retirement system is in general. And so yet yeah, clearly it has to be applied differently in different countries, but this is the way we thought about it for France. The first thing is that it has to be transparent from the point of view of uh, to retire is to be. Uh, and and uh, we think that the only way to do it is to have a point system in which if you have one year at the, uh, me, at the mean uh, wage, you get 100 points. If you have one year to, at twice the uh, mean wage, you have 200 points. And you just accumulate these points full life. And then when you decide to retire, then you transform these points into uh, euros or uh, uh, pounds, as the case as the case may be. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there should probably be a minimal age of retirement before which you cannot, under special circumstances, uh, get retirement benefits. We think it's important as a social norm. Uh, but given that we want to allow people to work longer and we want to reward them for that, not only because they work longer, they contribute more and that gives, this, this gives them more points. But in addition, their retirement will be shorter and therefore there'll be less of a cost to the retirement system and both have to be reflected. So it has to be actually uh, fair. And this gives fairly strong incentives to want to work longer. Uh, the second part is the equity and uh, the redistributive aspect of the system. And at least in France, it's obvious that the system has to be redistributive. What we argue there is that for the people who have accumulated less points, uh, they, should, they should get bonus points. Uh, exactly how and how much, this has to be decided as a function of how uh, redistributive you want to be, but that's a very transparent system. Uh, so when you come to the age at which you retire, you get additional points if you're, for example, in the two or three or four uh, bottom deciles of the uh, point distribution. Uh, where there are two issues which are very difficult to deal with. One is what we call in France penibilité, penibility, which is that some jobs are really hard. And what do you want to do? And what we've learned in France is if, it, if you open the door to this, uh, you get uh, not cheating, but, but, but loopholes. Uh, jobs which were hard uh, 100 years ago are now easy, but they still get a special treatment. So we think that that cannot be in the retirement system itself, it has to be a negotiation be between uh, social partners and we indicate how it could be done. Another very difficult issue is that uh, the expected uh, 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 length of retirement differs enormously among, uh, along various characteristics as a function of income. For example, it can be seven or eight years between the top decide and the bottom decide. The question is, what do you do? Do you basically allow you know, people who have a much shorter expected life, uh, retirement life, uh, to uh, leave early? And that was, Jean has not mentioned, in general, the 
commission has come to agreement on nearly everything. Uh, but on this one, there was no agreement. Uh, some of us wanted a lower uh, retirement age and others thought that for social norm reasons, symbolic reasons, this was not the way to go. So we didn't decide. The last thing is sustainability of a system, financial stability. Uh, and the way it's done in France uh, is basically it relies on the fact that the contributions are indexed to prices uh, sorry, the contributions are indexed to wages and the pensions are uh, indexed on prices. So to the extent that there's productivity growth, the system does better. If productivity growth decreases, it does worse. That sounds to us as just the wrong way of going. Uh, it is It relies on a variable, uh, which is very hard to predict, moves around. Uh, it should be much more explicit. So what we say is that, yes, when the life expectancy increases, there has to be a choice between higher contributions, but we exclude this because they are very high in France, uh, a higher age of retirement, minimal age of retirement, or lower pension benefits. That decision is a central societal decision. It really has to be taken in a democratic, explicit way, rather than some implicit mechanical uh, indexation system. And we explain how this can be done and uh, how it can be implemented. Now, that's for the reform of a retirement system. That's one leg. The other two legs, and like Carol has played an important role, uh, is you know how can you basically induce people to want to work longer? And it's, it's clear that a large dimension of this, not the only one, is chronic illness. And so there you have to be much more active in prevention, but also in organizing firms so that people with chronic illnesses can work in general, make it uh, more flexible, more you know, e easier to, to, to come to work. And we have to work on this a lot. On the firm side, we have to understand why they are so reluctant uh, to not uh, basically get rid of senior workers, but not hire them very much. And there, I think it's a, it's a mix of incorrect perceptions, legislation, which makes it more difficult uh, to try a senior worker. And so there, something has to be done. It's clear that the three legs have to kind of come together because if you just push a retirement reform without the rest, uh, you'll get the people in the streets. We saw that once, twice. Uh, and uh, it's going to be, it's not going to work. So this is where we are. Um, you know, it's very hard to, uh, this is a 500 page report. It's very hard to summarize it uh, that quickly, but I, I hope we've given us your sense of how we've got at it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Jean-Olivier. I, I, I'm going to turn, as I said, to the panel now very briefly to respond. I think, um, you know, just one quick thought on each. Nick, Nick, it seems to me that the key issue on the climate change recommendations is about this balance between the carbon price and everything else. And it'd be really good to get your reflections on, on that in particular. Richard, on inequality, I mean, I think what was really striking about that was the focus on not the snapshot of income inequality, but the inequality much more broadly considered, and particularly this idea of good jobs. So it would be really good to get your sense, particularly given that you're leading the Deaton Review of Inequality here at the IFS on how that plays um, out. And, and then, Carol, what, what really struck me was that what, what Jean and Olivier were saying about climate change and inequality really struck a chord um, in, in the UK debate. But at least the framing of the discussion on retirement was quite different to what we normally hear here, I think. Uh, it'd be quite interesting to get your sense of how to apply that or how that relates to the British um, situation. But anyway, I'll, I'll shut up there. And, uh, and Nick, perhaps you could kick off with your reflections on the climate change. Thank you, and thank you very much to uh, Jean and Olivier for asking us to join in what was a, a fascinating and important um, exercise. Um, on, on climate, let me say very clearly at the beginning that the focus on pricing and R&D uh, is absolutely right. They're top of the list of uh, relevant market failures. Um, it's not a balance between this and other things. These things have to be there. And I'd say they're the first two uh, relevant market failures in this uh, area. But what I want to argue is not to spend my few moments dwelling on agreement. 
that's not the LSE tradition. Um, what I wanted to do was to say where I would have gone beyond. Now, nearly everything I'm going to mention, I'll have to do it very fast and broad brush, but where I would have gone beyond um, is important and a big part of the story and I think did not receive enough emphasis. I think everything I'm about to say would actually be mentioned. It's not that they were ignored. It's a question of emphasis and prominence. The first is, this is public policy as if time matters. This is not simply looking at the marginal cost of doing this, the marginal cost of doing that, and saying that bad policies will uh, send us in the direction of high marginal costs. That does matter. That's why carbon pricing is so important. But um, at the same time, we have to drive down costs of different ways of doing things. We have to change big systems, cities, land, energy, and uh, transport. We have to manage dislocation. And we have to do it in real time to get to net zero by 2050. And actually, it's this coming decay that is particularly decisive in doing that. It's not where you get to only in 2050, that does matter. It's also cutting emissions very dramatically in this coming uh, decade. So how do you drive down costs? How do you change systems? And how do you promote investment and innovation? It's the dynamics of change that's so important. You don't redesign a city on a carbon price. You don't reform very damaging agricultural systems on a carbon price. Um, similarly, you don't reform fundamental transport and energy systems on a carbon price alone. It must be there. It's your North Star. But at the same time, you've got to invest in changing those systems as well. How the grid system actually functions. Electricity to France, for example, is not a particularly uh, strong posture of international collaboration and innovation uh, elsewhere. Those are the kinds of structural uh, institutional issues, along with policy issues, that you have to put at center stage. This is uh, about driving change in costs, driving change in systems, and promoting investment and innovation. In the work we did for the G7, we reckon that G7 countries um, in order to recover from the recession and in order to get on a much more sustainable uh, route for growth and development, would have to increase their investment by a couple of percentage points of GDP. And uh, that's perfectly possible. It's where we were 15 or 20 years ago. But you need the clear, strong policies. It's macroeconomically very feasible too. But you have to drive that uh, or facilitate that change with the right kind of investment climate. These are all issues about pace of change, nature of change, which are not tackled by price and uh, R&D alone, crucial that those things are. And that's a new kind of economics. And we've got a full range of economics that we already have and more than we can develop. We've got richness in our subject can tackle these things. Secondly, and I have to be very quick here, the range of market failures, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon price at the top of the list and R&D, second on that list, but also capital markets to foster that investment and innovation, fundamental importance. The functioning of networks, grids, of course, public transport, we're using recycled broadband, functioning of networks where, of course, Jean has led the charge on many of those things. Information of fundamental importance and the co-benefits are immense. I mean, Air pollution kills probably, is involved in probably 20% of deaths, perhaps more in the world. Uh, and that is a huge part of the uh, story and that we can bring in as well. So a much broader range of policies, recognizing it's not simply these six market failures that I'm pointing to. And they're not marginal, they're not add-on, they're big. It's also absent markets. So if you're fostering investment and innovation, expectations are fundamental with absent markets. We haven't got markets for the kind of technologies we're going to need 20 years now. We don't know what they are. We haven't got carbon prices 20, 25 years ahead. But we know from Keynes and Hayek and so on, from good economics, that helping set expectations is enormously important. That's why a clear, strong path is so fundamental. Finally, international. Um, 
you know, each country will will draw your attention to the fact that it's small in relation to the whole. Well, EU is actually not small in relation to the whole. But international collaboration is fundamental importance. The big investments will occur outside the rich countries. How we collaborate on finance, particularly around the multilateral development banks, but also the way international private uh, finance works will be enormous importance. How we collaborate on technology, as Jean emphasized, is enormously important as well. And finally, let me give one example of a French-led initiative on international collaboration is the network on greening the financial system, which is based in the Banque de France and uh, is a very important initiative, 90 central banks involved, and they're being very creative and thoughtful in taking on their responsibilities. So I would differ on the story about central banks. France is a tremendous example with its leadership of the NGFS and how to collaborate internationally and the role of climate in uh, central banking. Having said that, it's in the ministries of economics, in the finance ministries, in the transport ministries, in, in the ministries, ministries associated cities, where the big responsibility lies. But it's, uh, it's relevant for central banks as well. Right. Thank you. Well, gosh, we could spend easily the next 20 minutes on that alone. But, but Richard, I want you to just spend a minute or two on the inequality topic. Yes, thank you very much. Apologies, my internet is horrible today. And um, so I'll try and speak clearly and slowly. I should add, this uh, is a wonderful report and I think it sets some great challenges uh, uh, for researchers and policy makers alike. I very much enjoyed being part of it. Uh, a big surprise in a way was the commonality of challenges and the commonality of policies. Uh, and it's quite exciting uh, to kind of reflect on Nick's comments already, at least uh, in terms of the good jobs agenda and many aspects of that, it's already having an impact, I know at the G7 and G20 level because I've been involved in that. And as uh, Paul said, we're right in the middle of a large scale study of inequality, the Deaton Review. And one thing is for sure, and that is we can't address all the concerns about inequality through the tax and welfare system, welfare benefit system alone. And that's a key part of this report. We can tax better and we need to, especially capital taxation and coordination and inheritance taxation, and we can improve welfare provision. But we really do have to balance tax and welfare policies in a strategic way with other policies that address underlying concerns about inequality policies towards education, training and skills, labor market regulation, competition policy, don't always think of that as an inequality policy, but it surely is. And of course, place-based policies, because all these things happen in geographically concentrated areas. The focus on good jobs, Paul, you mentioned that. So let me say that I think it's an important one. I've been impressed working on the report and have generated, developed my own ideas on this. Uh, one thing we know, it's been really horrible at the bottom of the labour market in many economies, especially in the UK and the US, but also in France, in a way that isn't reflected by cross-section inequality measures, as Olivier pointed to so clearly. We may redistribute to households, but low, lower, but other things concern individuals, low earnings for the lower educated and poor wage and poor career profiles are a major concern and highlighted in the surveys that are part of this report and now part of our Deaton review, I should add. Um, and education and social mobility, to add to that, one very nice point they make is people do not think in France that everybody has a fair shot at a good education, and in turn, a fair shot at a good job, despite relatively low levels, relative to the UK at least, and in inequality. So good jobs and fairer opportunities for social mobility, I think, have to guide our policies towards inequality. And there's some really key ideas here. I won't spend time on them, Paul, because we don't have time. But 
they're very relevant and it's the kind of skills that produce good jobs and we know what they are and there's a really great research agenda thinking that through including the role of soft skills and skills we don't always have properly engraved engaged in our skill system in our training system in accreditation it has to be national it has to be transferable across firms and in the right firm type mix and there the point that Olivier made again about technology and the way that we could think of incentives around technology that are comp but provide innovations that are complementary to good jobs and uh, and uh, career profiles and I think these technologies could well match with Nick's concerns about the green, uh, green, and are all our concerns about climate change, those technologies can be um, thought of or developed in a complementary way with the good jobs agenda. And good jobs and lifetime careers are absolutely central to keeping people in work in a satisfied job over their long career, something that is not happening in France. It happens more in the UK, but actually at the bottom of the distribution, it's not really happening in any way we would like to see. And the issues and the challenges are very similar. So I found this a coherent and exciting approach that Jean and, and Olivier have really developed with all of the panel. And uh, I feel it has a lot uh, in common with our challenges. And it, it, the great coordination of research and policy in these areas is one of the most exciting things about the current times. So let me finish there. Thanks, Carol. Um, I think clearly, you know, when you think about the demography side, at a, at a big picture level, the French have some differences to the UK in that they do, they are one of the longest living countries in, in Europe and indeed the world. And there are some people who live in a very good quality of life. And there is less population aging than in the British context. But, and, and as, as, as Olivia has stressed, much earlier retirement, but there are similarities. There are inequalities in the length and quality of life that are not dissimilar to those in Britain, they're worse in Britain. There are also differences in working conditions that Richard and Olivier have alluded to that are particularly at the bottom end of the labor market, jobs are hard, not satisfying. And the other thing is the rise in chronic illness that you see in both countries, particularly, I think, one of the areas that hasn't been stressed enough in public debate is mental health and that mental health making working difficult. So I think what's exciting about the framing of the discussion here is that normally we think about these policies in different pots. We think about a health policy, we think about a retirement policy, we think about a social care policy, which isn't actually addressed in this report. And here we've tried to bring together the pension reforms with reforms in the labour market that not only address the specifics of the French context, but address the issues that we have that at the bottom end of the labor market, there are many people who have rising chronic illness from about age 40 onwards that makes them doing their work hard. So I think what we try to do in this report is both reflect on policies to support retiree, to support older retirement, and that's particularly French, but also policies to support workers in the labour market, where there are some very good European examples that I think the British could learn from as well, and also policies to support the health system to deliver more chronic care, care for the chronically ill and preventative care. And as we can see from COVID, that's a huge issue in Britain as well. But I think that the framing of this discussion as linking issues that have not been linked before, linking pensions and linking health is very exciting. And I think in the UK context is also the way to go about thinking how you get policy in one area supporting policy in another. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we've got lots of questions. Um, I, happily, the two that have come to the top of the Slido popularity um, poll are the two that I was keenest on asking. So, um, so we'll start with those. I'm not going to ask 
all of the panelists to answer them, uh, though, because we don't have time for that. The first one essentially is saying, and we were discussing this before we came on air, actually, um, this, 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 despite being a bunch of hard-nosed economists, this comes across as a little bit of a sort of centre-left type of um, uh, type of set of proposals. And um, certainly, certainly in the UK, that is not the government that we um, have. Um, so I think the question is, how, how does one go about selling and getting legislation for this sort of agenda? I'd like one of Olivier and Jean to take that. And then actually, I'm going to ask Nick, because he is, as well as being a professor of economics, he is a legislator in the House of Lords and perhaps has some insight into this. Let me start. Uh, is it centre-left? Maybe. Uh, but what we found is that there was a lot of agreement on, on, on the general principles within the Commission, much more than I expected. Now, Nick has indicated that on global warming, there are some differences. And uh, I, I gave the example of, uh, 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 of how to deal with uh, lower life expectancy. But these were... My sense is, you know, this is where economists are. And uh, and the commission excluded the people from the extreme left. I don't think there is any economist at this stage on the extreme right. Uh, but it's fairly representative. And uh, we agreed. So this is where we are. Now, you know, in France, the reaction was from some, well, this tax on inheritance shows that, you know, you're Marxists. Uh, and and uh, but the increase in the age of retirement shows that uh, you're fascist, and that's the way it is. Now, on on what happens next, I think the, the good thing is that this is not a report written by academics, uh, you know, on their own. It was asked by a president who has uh, a political but intellectual uh, ambitions. Uh, he has been very involved. Um, he has received, I think, the, the report. Uh, he has read it very carefully. Uh, he has indicated that he agrees with a lot of it. And then the question is, how is he going to carry it? Uh, so in France, it's very much a matter of, you know, what Mr. Macron will do with the report. If he wants to do something with it, uh, push some at the, before the elections and some after, if, he, if he's re-elected, uh, something will happen. But I think in general, it's useful for any country uh, to have a stock-taking exercise of that sort. I mean, you know, French politics is about immigration and security and safety. Uh, it, it would be good if these issues were actually dealt with and we knew where the various parties stood. This can help. This may fail. This may go on the shelf. Other reports have done that. Jean, do you want to add something? Well, let me just turn to, to Nick then. Nick, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm a crossbencher in, in, in House of Lords and no party affiliation. Um, is it centre left? I'm not sure it's a very helpful question. Um, it, what we're embodying here, if talking about climate change, but the other issues too, is respect for the opportunities that the future generations will have, respect for community and how we work together as communities to solve problems, particularly with climate change, getting markets to work well, tackling market failure, being, you know, seeing markets as the, the big driver of the key decisions. So responsibility for future, responsibility for, community, for the community, getting markets to work well. I don't know if that's left or right. It just sounds uh, decent to me. And uh, that's what we're uh, driven by. If you look at the history, it was under a Labour government that we brought in the Climate Change Act in the UK in uh, it, it just 13 or so years ago. It was Theresa May, a Conservative Prime Minister, who gave the commitment to net zero a couple of years ago. It was George Bush Sr., who was a key driving figure in creating the UNFCCC. Um, Dick Cheney seems to care a lot for the environment, although many of us don't care much for any other of his preferences. But these you know, are things which I think 
can cut across uh, simplistic left right uh, issues. So it's a fun question, but I don't think it's a very sensible one. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll always uh, it's, uh, undermine the question. I, I, I guess the I, I guess the broader issue is um, is, is about translating uh, what I think we as a group of economists, at least uh, as technocrats, think of as a very good set of ideas in into policy. But but we haven't got time to go further into that. Um, Jean, could you perhaps very quickly respond to what Nick said about um, about climate change earlier? Okay, well, thank you. No, I pretty much agree with what uh, Nick said. Uh, just a couple of precisions. Uh, on green central banks, and what we talk about in the report is not the Bank of France initiative, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we talk against a relaxation of prudential standards. So we don't want to have a new subprime crisis uh, because we relax uh, prudential standards. Um, also, we think there's an issue of legitimacy with a few actions that might be taken. So for example, if the central bank doesn't take uh, bonds because they are not quite green, then it should not take uh, German bonds, for example, because Germany actually emits much more carbon than French, than France. You know, that kind of issue and why, why carbon, what not uh, labor market policy, it, it's really complicated in the end. It's a political issue and, and we have to be careful with that. Um, we agree, I agree that we don't spend enough time on agriculture and cities. Uh, we actually, the commission it, itself didn't spend much time on that, unfortunately. Um, grids are very important. We need to improve that. We also agree that we need to have foreign collaboration. One thing, there was a question in the chat on the climate club. Uh, we agree with that because the United Nations is useful, but not that efficient. Many countries have a veto right if we want something which is signed by everyone. Um, so we have to start with the Climate Club. Now there was some disagreement uh, among members about whether it should be a separate Climate Club or whether it should be the G7. Um, there are arguments both sides. It's a complicated issue. Uh, and finally, there was a question also about an independent body um, uh, managing something which is heavily political. And, let me just say right away, just like for pension reforms and inequality, it's a political decision in the end. And, and COP21 has, has done it in a sense. We, we have some kind of carbon budget. And then the question is how to avoid political opportunism. And there are various discussions in, in the report. Uh, finally, I must say, you know, probably it has been announced, but the report exists in English um, and France strategy as a at the website where you can find the report in English. So you, you'll find much more than we have been able to say this morning. Thank you. We're running right up against time, but I, I, I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to ask it of, of, of all of you to, to, for, for some final thoughts. Uh, and that, that, that really is that it's the one that um, uh, is uh, towards the top of the um, list here, which is essentially, I suppose it's asking the question, you know, certainly in the UK, and I think this is partly true in France as well, the fundamental problem we're facing is a lack of growth in productivity and living standards um, over time. Uh, so, I, so, so I guess, um, you know, what, why, I, I suppose one question is, why didn't you focus on that? I mean, I think if we were going to look at something in the UK, that would have been right at the top of our list in terms of challenges, but I suppose more pertinently, um, what is there, uh, in your view, in the report which would help um, with, uh, with 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 uh, with that? Why, why, do, why don't we go in reverse order? Start start with so go Carol, Richard, Nick, uh, and then uh, 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 Olivia and John. Okay, I mean I agree with you on this, obviously, but I think within the report in the democracy chapter, we pointed out that there are rather underused resources. There are people who retire too early. There are people whose health makes them they would like to work, but they can't because their employers don't support them. 
and a, a group we haven't mentioned at all and is relevant in France and is obviously relevant here, we can see it in the discussion about footballers, uh, that there's a whole group of immigrants, migrants, uh, in fact, second generation and third generation in France who are completely underused in the labour market, who have faced large barriers and one of to entering the labour market and to in fact working as they wish to work. So that is, you know, speaking to the productivity challenge of trying to use the labour that you have better and trying to use underused labour. Richard. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think it's a really, the, the kind of good jobs agenda and the way the kind of skill match with technology and where we're going in matching skills with technology is about productivity. It's about productivity across the distribution, actually. And, um, you know, getting things to work for new types of firms with educated workers requires bringing the kind of whole group together. So this is where this kind of complementarity can help on both the inequality and uh, productivity arguments. That's why I found the kind of commonality of the questions and, and some of the policies to be very, very similar with what we need to address here and indeed address in North America and many other countries. So I, I put the productivity, it, it is true that productivity is low across, uh, right across uh, the education distribution in, in the UK. But I think this uh, kind of matching of skills and technologies is the way to think about it. That's going to be important in green technologies and for the type of things that Carol mentioned. Yeah, um, I think there is a big productivity story at the core of all three parts, actually. Uh, just on the climate part, so much of this is about resource efficiency and energy efficiency, that's productivity. So much of this is about innovation in different ways of doing things at, at, the, at the product level and at the system level. Cities where you can move and breathe seem to be a rather good idea for uh, productivity. Similarly, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. But you have to invest. This isn't all win, win, win. You have to invest to get there. And I think investment in um, human and natural and physical capital have been at the centre of all parts of the report. So this is a story of investment and a shift, as it were, of resources, which has to be early and strong. And that, of course, needs a political commitment. But productivity is everywhere, it seems to me. John Olivier, Olivier. Good. Now, we, we could have... Uh chosen higher productivity growth as one of the major challenges. Uh, it would be great if we could increase productivity growth by uh, you know, 1% a year or 2% a year, but there has been thousands of papers and attempts and it's, it's just very, very, very difficult. Uh, as That's the first point. The second is exactly what was said, which is that all each of the chapters indicates how we can have better growth, not necessarily higher growth, but better growth. And in some cases, higher growth. I mean, if we can make you know people work longer voluntarily, it will help and so on. Uh, it seemed to me that you know, even today, I am, I'm happy with the choice of topics. Uh, I think it's more important to avoid the end of the world, kind of. Uh, I think it's more important to avoid the end of democracy, which might well happen if we continue with the inequalities that uh, are happening. Given that, after this, I'm willing to think about other things. But this, this remain kind of my two point, my two uh, main worries. That's a curse of, of being last. Uh, at the risk of repeating the others, I completely agree that uh, growth is everywhere, investment is everywhere. As, as Nick said, it's a, it's a report about investment in the future. Um, as Carol said, uh, resources are underused and there are ways of doing better. Uh, education implies a lot of waste of talent. Again, there's more investment to be, to be committed there. Green R&D uh, doesn't directly increase growth, but of course, you have to look at the counterfactual, uh, which is what would happen if we keep uh, waiting, uh, keep, we keep with the waiting game, which of course will reduce growth substantially. 
at that point of time. So the report, as Nick said, is entirely about investment and, and living startups in some way. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we are um, we are beyond time. I mean, just two things to, to say at the end. First, uh, to repeat, Olivier, um, be better growth and avoiding the end of the world and the end of democracy seems like quite a good um, quite a good reason for doing this and quite a good reason for listening to what uh, what they've been uh, saying in this. And indeed, is uh, is, um, is is to a large extent what's driven our work on inequality as part of the Deaton Review here at the IFS. Second thing to say is that this was a very quick canter through an awful lot, but we actually have uh, events lined up in September, um, focusing on each of the three um, topics in significantly more detail. And we'll be sending round, obviously, uh, details of that. We'll keep an eye on the IFS website, but do come along then. Uh, but finally, thank you so much, uh, Jean, Olivier. Thank you. Uh, Nick, Richard, uh, Carol, that was a fantastic, um, a fantastic run through an enormous amount of incredibly important material. And thank you to everyone who's been listening.